Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Brown Center's uh, Spotlight. Today, we'll have Dr. Teresa Carmody speaking. Um, her topic is to read, a to read a body open, auto theory and the archive, which is described as combining personal narrative with readings of primary text and archival research to read a body open as a collection of auto theoretical essays about coming into creative and political self-awareness. Um, Dr. Carmody, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, you may begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, the Brown Center. And thank you, Stetson, for supporting this work um, through summer faculty grants. Um, through these grants, I've had the honor and the privilege of being able to visit a number of archives. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And this is a little bit um, work in progress. So I am trying out work. I mean, literally work that is also um, like I'm not done with it. So this it's in, this this will be interesting for me. Um, if you have, um, can everybody see this slide now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. We can great. See it. Um, it's in presentation mode though, so it's not a full That's, slide. Uh, so it's not, it's not a full slide. Yes, we can see like the the presentation mode um, of this basically, which shows the next slides and things of that nature. Okay, that's okay. I'm yeah. gonna. That's yeah, I'll, that's fine. Um, just because I don't know what else how to change it right now, so I'm just gonna go with it. Um, so this is this is a little bit of an informal talk. I have um, something about some of my thoughts um, on this collection of essays that I'm working on, and then I have a short um, reading. Uh, and but also, if there's questions or thoughts that you have, um, please feel free to post them in the chat, and we can either get into them um, afterwards or. Um, or have it be a little bit informal. Um, as, as Chris mentioned, this piece is called um, To Read a Body Open, Auto Theory in the Archive. To Read a Body Open is the title of a co um, collection of essays that I'm working on. So um, just to give you a little bit of context for me for how I'm coming to this, um, you know, I've been actually for decades a cultural activist, and um, I was part of a group of um, of artists who started the First Lady Fest in 2000, which was a six day arts festival um, celebrating and showcasing art, music, films, um, community based collaborations. Um, we were also raising money for um, trans organizations serving trans youth and serving. Um, you know, people who were um, ex uh, leaving or ex experiencing um, domestic violence or um, sexual assault, and um, and you know the my interest really in archival practices. Sort of, I realized when I was thinking about this that uh, early on in Lady Fest, we were also concerned with documenting what we were doing, um, and that there's kind of a long. Um, history of feminist recovery projects of different female or female identified artists, writers, and scholars that understand the importance of documenting our work, um, lest it not be seen. Um, Lady Fest has, I don't know what's going on with after the pandemic, but it continued for at least another 20 years in various places around the country. The idea was just take the name, make your own. Um, and so he, these are just a few examples of Lady Fest that happened um, you know, between 2020 and 20, um, or 2000 and 2020. Um, our own 20 uh, Lady Fest archives are now in the Fells Library, um, the Fells Library and Special Collections at NYU, which is actually one of the collections that Kate Eichhorn talks about in the archival turn in feminism, outrage and order. And, you know, and so this is one of the kind of theoretical ideas in my, um, overall collection as well. It's thinking about approaching the archive, um, not as, as, as she writes, a site of preservation, but rather as a, um, as an apparatus to legitimize new forms of knowledge and cultural production in the economically and politically precarious present, right? So, um, so it's been, uh, yeah, I, I'll just keep going. <laughs> Uh, my the talk is also or this collection is also informed by my um, long history working in feminist publishing. So with another group of um, this time mostly queer folks, I started um, 
Leifig Press in Los Angeles, publishing highly experimental works of poetry, prose, and translation. And um, we began thinking also about publishing in a more broad sense. So we were thinking about what does it look like when publishing becomes something, a text that's on a gallery wall, or what happens when publishing is a performance actually during a festival, and there's a document made, but it's actually the bodies doing the performance that's also publishing. Um, we were looking at collaborative uh, writing acts and um, just you know all, all different kinds of ways of thinking about sound image and text being something that moves off the page. And so, um, and you'll see when I get into sort of like what is auto theory that this work doing, you know, a lot of the um, work with Le Figue and the way that I started to rethink what publishing means, which to me is about making something public to, I root it through that word, um, is really also informing this collection of essays. So this essays, uh, these essays, um, they are, as Chris mentioned, combining personal narrative with readings of primary texts and archival research. Um, they're auto-theoretical, which I'll get into a little bit about what that is, um, about coming into my own creative and political self-awareness via readings of several writers um, whose work has influenced that process. So the essays are also experimental in their form and methods. So I am positioning my body as a living archive alongside official and unofficial archives of these writers. So I'm thinking about and reflecting on my own experience of engaging with these writers work over a period sometimes of um, you know, more than, than um, two decades of reading practices. I'm also drawing on the felt experience of being in an archive or of experience or of finding an archive um, in order to compose the essay, in order to compose the essays. So in this way, I really see the essays as um, emerging at kind of the crossroads of literary criticism, performance, and critical phenomenology. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about the false binaries of creative and critical or of literary criticism and literature, uh, of spiritual and material, of subject and object. Um, to me, the archive um, is a place for ritual, like there are certain rituals whenever you enter into an archive, there are certain things that you need to do in order to receive clearance, and there's um, certain kinds of processes and things that are allowed in that space, you know, no ink pens, for example. Um, and then I'm also really reckoning with the unstable place of female embodiment and the ideological underpinnings of racialized subjectivity. So I'm thinking also not about my own positionality as a queer, feminist, white um, artist and, um, you know, who grew up in a really intensely religious um, environment where I wasn't allowed to read books except for if they were christian books or the bible and so how do how does that experience of a very scripted and conscripted and oppressive you know reading practice how how do these writers and artists actually help to read my body open literally um so i see um Ultimately, the essays, um, I'm sort of embracing an intersectional feminism as a kind of hope. So that leads me to auto-theoretical work um, and, uh, and what is auto-theory? So um, this is a sentence from an essay I published in the LA Review of Books. Um, so in auto-theoretical work, personal experience informs the writer's understandings of theory, which recursively informs the personal experience. So both the body of the text and the body of the writer are sites of curiosity and knowledge. The text may take a more experimental form, even as the writer may be made over via the writing. Um, so in, in writing that particular piece and in thinking through what auto theory is, there's been two um, thinkers and writers, especially who have been important to me. So one is Lauren Fonier, um, it, Auto Theory as Feminist Practice in Art Writing and Criticism, and then also Ariana Schwarzes, um, and who has these two really fantastic essays. 
And both of them um, also talk about how auto theoretical work, this work that really thinks about um, that thinks about personal and theoretical in the same space really emerged out of um, writing and work ex by especially like queer or lesbian identified women and especially women of color. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we move on. Um, so, but a few characteristics of auto theory and as I say here, but listen, I'm not going to define something that resists definition and categories, work that foregrounds questions over mastery and barf that term, art that engages in a practice of reading while considering who is and isn't included and what kind of embodied and emotional experiences are voiced in various spaces and discourses. So auto-theoretical work, um, even from my little intro into this definition, um, is engaging with philosophy or critical theory, but also thinking about embodiment. So the personal experience of being in the world and in the text or in the discourse that one is engaging with. It's often playing with form, including multimedia, photography, drawing, or performance. And it's multiple and relational. So it's thinking about interdisciplinarity. It's thinking about performing citation, including lateral citation. So the people that you are in community with at the moment and amplifying um, that community and amplifying the way that all knowledge production really is about us being in conversation with each other. So it's sort of amplifying other modes of relation over um, a kind of like one person, like the, the, um, the great the great man idea or like the exceptional individual idea. Um, also theory and writing become more than a text. Um, as Ariana Schwarze says in um, her article in the Michigan Quarterly Review, exploring auto theory has helped me foreground the value of situatedness. So placing myself and my perspective into the historical, political, economic, and social context of the topics I'm exploring as I write. Um, and, uh, and this is also this kind of, yeah, thinking about yourself, thinking about the position at your positionality within a broader social and political landscape and aesthetic landscape is um, absolutely always foregrounded in this kind of work. Both Suarez and Fournier talk about, like, you know, talk about auto theory as specifically a feminist practice. And they talk about this term that probably many people here have heard before, the personal is political. And um, I think that this is fascinating. Um, I'm gonna see if I can, uh, let's see if I can, can you all see this website now instead of my slideshow? We cannot. You cannot. Okay, let me do this. Okay, can you see it now? Um, we can only see your uh, main screen as it stands right now. How about now? Now, yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the personal is political. So I, as a as a young um, feminist in the '90s, you know, I encountered this term um, early on in women's studies classes, in writings of you know all kinds of feminist writings that I was reading from Audre Lorde to Bell Hooks, um, and I kind of you know um, think I had somebody explain something about it, but also it started to make sense. It's like oh, the way that the political system is impacts your personal experience of your life, right? Abortion is legal, and then it is not legal. I mean, this is kind of an extreme, but a very potent example of this. You know, you're free, you're legally allowed to marry the person you love, or you're not legally allowed to marry the person that you love. But also what kinds of economic and, um, and social um, opportunities are open to you, and also what kind of what what are the beliefs that you're holding internally about yourself and your world? And as I've been sort of delving into archives to figure out more about like where this term came from, I um, came across, I mean, Carol Hanish, and many of you maybe already know 
Um, but it actually came out of this essay that she wrote, a paper that she wrote, and this is from her website. Um, this is the initial on the on the um, the right side, the initial piece that she wrote, um, and she was sort of responding actually to um, a conversation that was happening in a women's consciousness raising group like a women's liberation movement group that was actually here in Gainesville. So it was in Florida. So this, <laughs> which I think is pretty cool. Um, and so she had written this piece, which on this side, um, she said that the, it was actually a memo originally titled some thoughts in response to Dottie's thoughts on a women's liberation movement, which I think is fantastic. Um, but it had this title and then it was actually through it being published and some other editors, including um, Shumleth Firestone, and I'm trying to see if it says at the bottom here. Yeah, Shumleth Firestone and Ann Coat gave it that title, the personal is political. But as Carol says in these essays, like that idea that the personal is political, that the per your personal life reflects the political moment and a whole structure um, wasn't anything necessarily new, right? Um, it's also interesting to read this piece from 1969 because one of the things that it was that they were um, one of the criticisms was this idea that women's consciousness raising groups were therapy and that therapy isn't politics and um, and so in many ways this is kind of a refutation of that idea of therapy. It has a different idea. Like I think therapy is much more accepted now than it was then. Um, and, uh, but I think it's, I do think it's fascinating and, and, and to sort of go into this idea that women's consciousness raising groups were actually about coming together and over a series of questions. So I'm going to just show you, um, let me, um, show you this, uh, how to start your own consciousness raising group reprinted from a, a leaflet at the Women's Chicago Liberation Union. So the idea being that people are coming together and having conversations about specific questions and then mapping um, or sort of drawing connections between their experiences and their attitudes and beliefs and starting to develop a political and critical consciousness around that. And, um, and so you can just see a number of the kinds of questions that were being raised. And you see this practice like more recently with the evangelical movement, for example, with people sort of leaving the um, white evangelical church that has come really um, in the wake of the 2016 election, there's been a lot of this, a similar thing about like posing questions and raising questions and discussing on social media or in groups or in blogs or in interviews or podcasts, like making connections between ways that um, things that you thought that, that maybe um, you learned were some problem with you. Like, oh, you just, you know, are feeling convicted in your um, praise and worship session. And that's why your heart is racing is because you know that you're, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about specifically going to like a, a particular kind of um, church service, right? So starting to have this feeling of like deep conviction, but what happens or, or being told that it's a conviction because there's something wrong with you that you're living some kind of sinful something as opposed to realizing like, oh, maybe actually that's a panic attack because you feel like there's no space for you to be in that space, right? So I think I think that there's, um, I, so I wanted to pause on this because as somebody who went to school in the 90s and sort of as a third wave or, you know, somebody who's been a feminist for many years, um, there was always this, I would receive, and sometimes from women who took place in consciousness raising groups, that there was this thing that there would be, um, like they would end up being painful, that they would end up being mostly white women. And I think those th two things can be true, are true, like those, but I think there's also things that um, this, this activity of getting together and having and sharing personal information toward um, 
thinking about a broader political consciousness is um, is one of the great uh, legacies and and gifts um, from feminism, and also is one of the great things that art and writing can give us. Um, so let's see. Are we back to my thing here. Okay. So I'm going to just go ahead and um, I don't know if there's any questions, but I was going to just read a little teeny bit from an essay in progress and then um, open it up to questions and conversation. So let me just get back to this play from current slide. Nope, so I don't want that. If you hit swap displays, you should be able to show the full slide. Swap displays. Top left corner of your screen when you're sharing. Okay. Go ahead and share the, yeah. Go ahead and share the slideshow and then I'll tell you again where it's at. Okay, sorry, I'm just, I'll make it over here. Slideshow. Okay, so I see oh, swap displays. Yeah. There you go, perfect. Okay, got it. And then let me run over here real quick. Okay. Um, so this is um, just a few pages from um, the beginning of an essay at the altar of her divine on Audre Lorde and T. Corinne. Um, I'm not gonna read the epigraphs. You realize you are not heterosexual despite decades of social grooming from television, books, and children's church, parents, older siblings, and godparents who called you pretty and told you to be nice and did not call you tough and big man and puppet your hands into boxing moves like they did your younger brother. You realize you are not heterosexual and remember the first time you met Jay, your neighbor friend, she wouldn't play because she thought you were a boy and had learned not to play with boys. And when you realize you are not heterosexual, you wonder if Jay was picking up on some part of you latent and wanting to express because even though Jay later said that your short hair had confused her, your elder sister wore the same short cut. And as far as you know, she had never been mistaken for a boy or maybe she had but did not tell you because it did not pop out at her as strange or memorable. So maybe the significance of this memory is not that Jay saw something queer in you, but that you at the age of four recognized something to remember within Jay's words. Realizing you are not heterosexual shifts your relationship to your sexuality, to your body, both become yours as you become someone new, queer, lesbianic outlaw, unmarriageable because it's the aughts, the early 2000s, and gay marriage is not legal. This claim to your own body and sexuality, to your own pleasure, that's what you've been taught to fear. We're told you weren't capable of handling. Take care of my Teresa, your dad once said to the boyfriend who wouldn't kiss you on your mouth or read your writing. Your dad, who would not teach you about cars because you weren't a boy, you took a basic automotive class from a feminist car dyke instead, who scoffed at your college education because you did not know how many pounds were in a ton, 2,000 you later learned. Our economic and social structures run on the libidinal energy of humans. Patriarchal religions and ideologies have divided humans into class and race and gender-based systems of authority while suppressing human sexuality and quarantining sex from the source, the spiritual charge, which animates all life. This idea comes from Austrian psychoanalyst and social psychologist William Wilhelm Reich, who wrote in the 1930s about the relationship between sexual suppression and human exploitation, noting that such suppression occurred with the end of matriarchies and goddess cults that enjoined the spiritual and sexual, and with the establishment of an authoritarian patriarchy. Reich describes how contemporary authoritarian structures, the family, the church, the military, distort what is natural and good within the child toward an impotent yet fervent feeling of religiosity and nationalism, fueled by an unconscious brimming with respect, repressed energies. These repressed energies emerge as cruel, sadistic, lascivious, lasciv 
lascivious, I can't say it, um, rapacious and envious in, impulses. Yet the repressed is not, as Reich notes, the biologic core, which is an essentially honest, industrious, cooperative, loving, and if motivated, rationally hating animal. I find this biologic core and sense of natural connection within Audre Lorde's notion of the erotic. We have been raised to fear the yes within ourselves, our deepest cravings, writes Audre Lorde in her 1978 essay, The Uses of the Erotic, The Erotic as Power. For Lorde, the erotic is a deeply held internal resource within each of us, a feeling of deep inner connection, the inhabited awareness of your life force and capability, of your intuitive inner knowing and capacity for joy, for life. The erotic is spiritual and sexual and sensual. It, quote, heightens and sensitizes and strengthens all our experience, end quote, to embrace the erotic as a resource within us quote, we begin to live from within outward, continues Lord, and become responsible to ourselves in the deepest sense. You realize you are not heterosexual and give yourself yes. Two, I thought I would bring my friends into this essay, would ask them to share something with me, a sexual or sensual experience of self-realization, a moment of felt intensity that shifted their perception of what had been and could be. I would ask my friends, will you trust me with your story? Will you let me hold this part of you? This idea came while looking at the Cunt Coloring Book, a 1975 work by US lesbian artist and writer T.A. Corinne. Initiated in 1973 as a teaching tool for sex education groups, Corinne's vulvas are visually compelling, black line drawings that linger between abstraction and representation. True to its pedagogical aim, the book's first image includes anatomical terms and arrows, clitoral shaft, clitoral hood, clitoral head, plus caña de clitoris, prepuse clitorine, glance y eichel de kleitzers, the, color, the cunt coloring book may be considered a lesbian love child, a multilingual switch, key words, relational aesthetics, participatory art, erotic. Imagine not only before the internet, but before 1968 challenges to US obscenity laws that in many states classified even information about birth control as obscene and thus illegal. Imagine attending art school in 1963 like Corinne did and hearing about paintings with nude humans made by artists like Michelangelo, but not being able to view those paintings because it was not allowed. So maybe like Corinne, you decide at home that evening to draw a picture of your own vagina, legs spread before a mirror, seeing this part of yourself, strange yet familiar and intimate unknown. Perhaps like Corinne, you tear up that drawing before anyone, a husband, a cishet male lover finds you or it. Fast forward to 1973 and the US Supreme Court ruling that women have the right to privacy and liberty and the legal authority over their bodies, including the right to abortion. And in a wave of excitement and necessity, you ask your friends to pose as you make pictures of their cunts. You have by this point left your husband or male lover and are doing things with, with women that were previously unimaginable. Sex, yes, but also talking, letting your imagination grow. The drawings in this book are of real women's cunts, writes Martha Shelley in the cunt coloring book, Short Introduction. Why coloring? Corinne explains in an equally succinct forward. Coloring is a way for the child in each of us to revision and reclaim this portion of our bodies from which we have been estranged. I speculate into Corinne's encounters with her friends and lovers, the woman who posed as her models. What did that moment feel like, panties off as the model parts her legs towards the artist who eyes her pussy directly, not askew, nor as a block list of synonyms, though these can also be pleasurable. The cunt coloring book embodies a more intimate performance, like asking my friends about an erotic experience, knowing I would publicly share some version of their words. So I'll stop there um, and stop sharing and sort of open it up to questions. Maybe we can come to a gallery view so it's not just me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, and yes, if you're eating, please, it's great. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I'll start with a question, which there's a lot here and it's all amazing. Uh, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of, uh, and it's discussions that we've had in the English department at Stetson about this relationship between creative and critical work. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, when it comes to the personal and the, the political, right? Like oftentimes we, we do this sort of an analogy between what is creative is personal. Um, but I think I see in your work, right, a kind of like criticality that is necessarily um, personal because of the kind of like feminist and, and kind of, um, um, you know, kind of queer aspects of it that you, you have to be critical about those things when you're in a society that is, you know, necessarily trying to repress it or, or kind of, um, and so I'm wondering if you could um, if you could speak to that sort of um, I don't know intersection or those the axes between the critical and the creative and also the kind of like auto theoretical. Yeah, yeah. That thanks. That's a giant question. <laughs> so I'll speak to like a, 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 a some of it. I mean, I think that you're right that like the that creative gets cordoned off in some ways as being this place where the personal can exist which if you remember in the history of like the inst the institution, like creative arts are a relative newcomer to the institution of higher ed, right? Um, so that said, and you know, Joel and I were at our watch party last night for um, Stephanie Burt and, and we're talking about how, like cl how clearly she was positioning her own identity and also positioning like creating poems that become a space for others to come into and understand their own identity as well. That was absolutely something that was happening in the second wave feminist movement. Like I kind of, you know, the poets and poetry in general was a way that not just the poets, but that other people were figuring out who they were and what was possible in terms of feeling the, the contours of their own bodies and their own experiences. And there was a, um, so I think it's like, you know, what, what would happen, what happens when we talk about, um, when we talk about literature and art or the text that we're studying as being also ways of embodying a particular form. And it could be a creative text, but like a textbook, like what happens if we start thinking about the critic, like bring that same criticality to like an academic essay, right? It's like, that's also a particular kind of political form. And it's embedded, embeds particular kinds of, um, you know, discourses and power, power structures. And, um, and it's not that, um, it's not to like say that, oh, you know, we shouldn't have um, critical essays. Like I'm, I love, I love re reading critical essays, right? But rather how can we bring a kind of um, awareness that there's actually a full bodied person who's creating that work that that kind of critical essay is also a creative act and that one's critical interests are deeply informed by one's own personal experiences and that therapy helps all of us <laughs> if you have a good therapist. Like, um, and so like how, so it's like, I think it's this kind of, it's the binarization and the kind of false divide between these things um, that does that that kind of continues to perpetuate a lot of damage um and um and disconnection from ourselves right and um and uh and from our own embodied experience so and i think auto theory you know again which it's like um starting you know going back to like um poetry but also like lord's essays are just so clear, but also so many feminists that were writing at that time, they were writing about their personal experience in order to describe larger um, political situations um, in order to, you know, and, and it's like it's profoundly, profoundly shaped um, the world that we're in now in ways that isn't often given due. So it's just like the beginning. It's a great, I mean, I think um, ultimately, you know, all writing is creative, right? And cr and creative writing, like poetry, I mean, there's a long history, especially in poetry, of that being a place to work out philosophical ideas. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Hannah. Hey, um, just thanks so much for all of that. That was really great. I'm gonna, ha I have one of those annoying questions that might be more of a comment, so I apologize. Um, but hearing you talk about the archive and I've forgotten the quotation that you, that it was very exciting and um, I'd like to see more again. I love this idea of embodiment in the archive, but I'm thinking about like then Huffer's not about Foucault and the experience of like being in the archive as one that is also affective. And of course mm -hmm. you have, so you've drawn out so much affect and I'm wondering, could you speak a little bit more about embodiment and feeling um, and how it how you register it and theorize it um, in, in the essay collection more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I'm still in the process of figuring those out, but what else, but, but what is interesting to me, and I haven't, like, this is sort of like perking up in, um, in different, um, in different essays, right? So there is this idea of like the archive, you know, to go to like Foucault and other, you know, like these great men. Um, but there is the idea of like the archive as creating this kind of order and it's a monument and it it is necessarily incomplete, right? And um and 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 that so so there's that. What's also interesting and how, one of the ways that I've been thinking about the archive, and I'll be clear, um, so my first of all, I'm I came to the art to, to different artists archive rather unofficially. So I started with like um, a scholarly edition of um, the Pargeters by Virginia Woolf, like a scholarly edition of an incomplete manuscript that I became super fascinated with and looking at digital um, archive manuscript pages from that. Then I found in this desk in my basement, that's a whole long story, the essay explains that I actually found an archive of Kathy Acker materials that were hidden in a desk for 20 years that, you know, became clear at that moment. And then since then, I've also, you know, visited a number of official archives. So Clarissa Spector's um, at the Rue Barbosa in Rio um, de Janeiro, um, Audrey Lords at Spelman College, Juna Barnes um, at the University of Maryland, um, and T. Corinne's at the University of Oregon. And what's interesting is that, so you have like, um, so yeah, so you, so each of those, it's like you're part of the thing that's, it, that is kind of the affective experience is that you're actually touching materials that this writer touched. Like you're actually seeing their handwriting you're actually like going through their journal or their calendar and you're seeing the kinds of notes that they put or also just like their strange marginalia or things that just happen to be lurking around. You're also reading letters to them. You're not necessarily reading the letters that they wrote to other writers. Like for those, you would have to go to those writers' archives. So what you're receiving is sort of like the things that came to them and as a fiction writer, there's a way that I'm still working out, but there's a way where it's like you're sitting within their perspective, like you're really in their point of view more solidly. You're seeing the things that when they were sitting, these are the things that surrounded them in their everyday life, not necessarily what they were putting out into the world, which would be publications or like I said, like those letters to other people. What's also interesting is that is just this kind of like, um, and I don't, I can't, I can't remember the word right now, um, but there's this kind of like affective glimmer that hangs around a, a writer's collection. And part of it is what I'm bringing, like my experience that I'm bringing and my understanding of them, but also just certain things that you start to this this unexplainable thing that you catch, you know, and I think um, the summer that of 2019 when I visited Audrey Lord's archive, um, and then just a couple of weeks later visited Juna Barnes collection in Maryland. To me, that was the most um, stark contrast of two writers, like two, um, like you know, I mean, Lord identified as a lesbian. Um, Barnes, who, you know, is like queer as F, right? But she's like, I'm not a lesbian, you know? Um, you know, you have like this second wave feminist, like, 
you know, you know, 20th century and like early 20th century, but just the, the, the way that, um, like the kind of energetic, like the sense of how Lord, as she continued her life was like wrapping herself in, uh, radical self-love. Like there's a reason that radical self-love is sort of like roots back to her. And I could feel that I could feel this kind of, you know, where she was, um, like working through stuff and coming over and again to like what was important for her and like letting her intuition, letting her erotic knowing, being a kind of North star for how she was going to direct her attention. Whereas with Barnes, it was like, she could never like, nothing was ever good enough. So what I found was like incessant, incessant uh, revisions. And people asking for her work and her refusing, you know, it was like she wouldn't and and like people complimenting her work and her being like, well, then you must be a bad reader. I mean, just like this intense, intense, like severity. Um, and, you know, and she had a like I had um, done a lot of research on her before. So I know like she had a lot of super traumatic childhood that is beyond what is like, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's well beyond, you know, I mean, I can't even like her grandmother, um, had pet names for her grandmother's breasts that she would write Barnes letters as a young adult and refer to her breasts, her grandmother's own breasts by these pet names. And she shared a bit. I, there's like a lot, there's a lot right of stuff. And so, but it was just clear that like Barnes, like the stakes of Barnes not being able to, or just not having the opportunity because of time, like where she was in history and also things that were like clutched inside, like she couldn't unclutch. And that's so clear that, that feeling, like I often would leave literally feeling like I was going to have to throw up. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So that's something I'm still like um, the I'm reading right now this book called Animal Joy by Noir Eldesir, and um, she has some language for this that I can't remember right now. But she's kind of theorizing this like affective thing um, in a way that's interesting, different than like Berlant or I, don't, I mean, she uses all that kind of stuff too. Anyway, hope that answers. <laughs> yeah, Joel. Yeah, Teresa, thank you so much. I came in a, a bit late, um, but but I thank you for the conversation last night too. Uh, one thing that I'm wondering about is is the those byways that you don't get to follow up on or that you don't get to fold into the book that you're working on. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, do, do you have a couple of those, one or two of those that, that you, you might follow up later or or um, you know, you had you, you felt like you just had to exclude it from this work, and and you know why and what you're thinking about those. Yeah, I mean that's a good, that's it. I I think to be honest, right now, and this is why I put in a um, application for a year long sabbatical. <laughs> like I need the time to actually figure out what's going to be in this book and what's not. Um, and so and so in terms of ideas, I'm not totally sure what's going to be left out. What I do know is that some of the explorations are moving into other forms that I didn't include necessarily in this presentation. So I included some pictures, for example, from T. Corinne's coloring book, including a kind of briefly like whizzed past where I'm starting to color one, but there are some other kinds of visual objects or ways like Ooh. other, other forms that, um, that, uh, aren't necessarily text that that are going to that have emerged out of this work and that will exist in other ways and I think that's great like I don't think I think a book is like an incomplete like just like any archive is incomplete a book is an incomplete thing right and that there's ways of continuing that kind of you know iterative um uh curiosity by, by thinking about like, well, what happens if something becomes, you know, like what happens if I bring this into a performance or what happens um, if I, if I like with the, um, 
the essay on Lord and Corinne, I actually have like an altar that I've built and it's a, it's not done. It's I'm still doing it, but that's probably, I, I don't know if I'll show anybody any of that ever, or if that's a private thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay. Oh, thank you, Hannah, for that in the chat. Uh, can I ask another question? <laughs> yeah. Kind of relates. Um, and I'm really, I really love this, this turn of phrase, the affective glimmer. Um, and I, I was recently introduced uh, by Alison Parks, who's in uh, political science, to this book, Disidentifications, mm -hmm. by Esteban Munoz. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that, you know, we have these uh, representations of, um, you know, queer identity that uh, are in the public mainstream. Um, and they're bad representations that mm -hmm. we don't want to identify with them, but they are what are available. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about this in, let's say, contrast to this affective glimmer of the archive. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, you had this feeling that came over you when you're reading um, a writer's collection where you can actually um, kind of feel embodied in some sense. Um, and I'm I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on this like idea of disidentification or this idea of bad representations that are more mainstream, um, and and how that plays against maybe some of these uh, less accessible or less uh, maybe prominent or more niche sort of uh, archives in which you can actually have an affective glimmer. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'll have to, I'll admit, like, that's, that's one of, um, you know, as is works I had, it's like on my list. So I'm glad it came up because I haven't actually, um, actually read it. So I can't speak. Um, I, I feel, I don't want to like misrepresent, so I can't speak exactly. Um, but what is interesting or as you're talking, um, like one of the things that I feel like, um, Like I'm, I'm thinking about how I began this talk with some images of um, Lady Fest, right? Which is like this whole like queer, like a um, mostly queer, but like the Riot Girl movement, which was it was a very queer movement, and it was very much, you know, it was not Ellen, you know, it was not like um, uh, it was, and it was very much like. Uh, sort of in opposition and, and, and critical of some more um, mainstream um, representations of, um, of, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to speak to everybody in the movement, like I'm just speaking about my, or the movement, I'm just speaking about my experience, it was like, I don't want to, you know, it's like, how can you actually have a critique also of capitalism, like that's going to, if you're if you're critiquing capitalism, then you're gonna you're not there's gonna be certain um issues about um modes of production. You're gonna be thinking, you're gonna be like, you know, it's like basement shows and you know, it's a different, it's a different vibe. So um, but I but it's something to think through um now for me personally. Um, and I'm saying this. It's like, I think sometimes things when you, when I was young that I would reject as being mainstream. So those kinds of more conventional representations. Now I can understand some of their political significance in a way that I couldn't at the time because I was so interested and so and needed to distinguish myself from those things. You know, and because personally, again, I can't, it was like, I wasn't going to fit in with that other world either. Not like, I, not that I fit in with, I mean, I think I was like a weirdo in Lady Fest to ask any of the people, like, um, they were like, <laughs> uh, but I, but so, so anyway, I don't know if that really answers it's, it's, you know, I think it's, I think what's, um, Yeah, it. I think it's there's there's ways of like working through your own stuff, like working through your own um, your own like trauma that allow you to see things in a broader and more um, generous way. 
like you become more generous with yourself and it, it helps you to become more generous with others. I'll just end it there. Yeah, I appreciate that. One thing that uh, comes to mind is, you know, you came and visited the banned books um, mm -hmm. uh, class that we had, and we talked about um, how censorship can be something as easily as just not knowing what is out there. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this idea that um, the representations that are on hand are the ones that we can kind of congregate around, um, and then uh, maybe yeah. they're the best ones, but as we get to know more and more, and, you know, you as someone who has worked in publishing and has, um, you know, brought attention to other people's work and have your own work published, I think it's, it's quite interesting to think um, that, uh, you know, uh, there is something about representation that is not just about like representation in a, in, a, in a vacuum, but actually about exposure to things that have been represented by people that we might not know about quite yet. Absolutely. And that is, and, and also like, um, absolutely. And also that's the way, like having something be considered, um, like when something is, um, you know, it's like, okay, working in publishing, something's going to generally get a large publisher if somebody, if the publisher thinks they can sell it. Like that's just, so it's like, is it marketable, right? And if it, and it might be marketable because it, it fits a certain kind of expectation, or it might be marketable because the person's name on it has the kind of cultural capital to make it marketable. So, you know, um, but there, but meanwhile, there's like, the whole, like the world of poetry, for example, contemporary poetry, where 95 to 98% of the books are published by smaller micro presses that aren't, of you, those books aren't available, you know, um, they're, you have to kind of know in order to know where to go to start even exploring what those books are, you know, or more experimental work. So there's, there's many ways to suppress, um, yeah, exactly. Many ways to suppress and ban. So with Le Figue, we were particularly interested in publishing work that had been, that was um, illegible um, to the market. So, and I see that there's a question here um, from Terry. Can I talk about bras and Clarice? <laughs> um, yes. So I almost uh, was going to read from that piece, but then I decided uh, not to today. Um, but <clears throat> one of the, the piece on Clarice Lispector, one of the things that um, that gets into is um, my own experience with um, breast cancer and these um, surgery bras that I had after undergoing two lumpectomies a week apart um, in the er in early June of 2016. And, um, and I had saved those, uh, bras as kind of this ritual, like as, as an object, like I had a, a friend who said like something, you'll do something with them. Um, and I didn't know what that might be, uh, um, at all. But when I was, when I started, um, when I started working on my, uh, the essay on Clarice Lispector, one of the things that I had found in her archive was a series of paintings that she did that were on, they were very, um, like, uh, they're all on pine board. It's sort of these experiments in, um, creativity and movement and presence and, um, and color, you know, they're, and, and they're, they're, they're beautiful and rough and they're only, as far as I know, there's never been a uh, exhibition of them. You know, I think part of why they're interesting is because Caris made them, you know, um, but they're also, but there also are like sort of stunning in their own way and the experience of actually seeing these paintings um, and, you know, holding them and sort of going through, you know, taking these pine woods and the way that she's working with the wood also, and she kind of incorporates that into the piece. So one of the things I started doing was actually replicating um, some of the paintings um, on the surgical bras with embroidery thread as a way of kind of meditating on Clarice's work, but also as doing this thing that turns this object into something else. I don't know what will ever happen with the bras. You know, maybe they'll 
I don't know, but they are, um, but they also, the images feel important. The images themselves of the bras are part of the essay. So there's a section, you know, like um, there's a se each section ends with just an image and there, it's a three-part essay. Um, so yeah, and uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's that, you know, and that's kind of continuing. Any other questions? We went the whole, these are good questions. This is like when you get your um, your English department colleagues. Love it. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> and I love seeing some of our um, MFA students here, Brianna and Vic, and I think Dona is here. It's so fantastic. And um, Seriaco, who teaches in the program as well. Um, it's so lovely to have you all here. Um, and of course, Paula. Uh, who helps us all go. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think we're about at time then. So um, thank you everyone so much for being here and uh, for your excellent questions. And um, this is a, is a work in progress. And so I was delighted to be able to use this to have a conversation and pushes me to think um, think more about the work. So um, I look forward, um, you know, Chris and Hannah and Joel and Terry to, and everyone, but to more conversations about this. So thank you, Teresa. That was great. And thank you with the Brown Center and thank you Stetson for the faculty summer grant.